Hi, I'm Miss Pam from the Billie Jean King Main Library. And I'm Janine from the Mark Twain Library. Welcome to Chapter Chat, our monthly conversation highlighting new books from our elementary school and middle school collections, airing the second Wednesday of every month. We will each talk about four, we usually each talk about four new books that have arrived on our shelves in the last six months, but this month is a little different compared to the previous months because we'll be talking about books with, uh, with an Asian Pacific Islander American main character that are written by Asian American authors. Because of, because of the specific criteria, we chose books that were not recently published within the last six months but we'd like to showcase those that have been published within the last five to six years. With that being said, let's begin and we will start with you, Pam. Take it away. All right. Well, I'm starting with my most serious book. This is Brother's Keeper by Julie Lee. This is a story of Sora and her family. They live in North Korea and they are there when the communists have taken over. So it's very hard for them. They have to hide their Bible. They have to watch what they say. They just have to be careful of everything that they do. And it gets even harder for Sora because her parents make her stay home from school to take care of her little brother while they work. And she loves school. So sometimes she sneaks down to school and she listens to the lessons. And then in 1950 in November, the Korean War is starting and her parents decide that they need to leave while they can because people around them are disappearing. And they, they, they have relatives in South Korea, so they're going to go there. So they pack up what they can carry and they sneak out at night and then they start making their way along with lots and lots and lots and lots of other refugees trying to make their way to the border. And along the way, there is a bombing attack and it separates Sora and her brother, Young Sung from her parents and her littlest brother. So she doesn't know if they're dead or alive, but she knows that they have to keep going. So her brother, Young Sung is eight. And so the two of them just follow the road south and sometimes they meet nice people and sometimes not so nice people. But then her brother gets sick and he can't walk is a cough that won't go away and he just gets weaker and weaker because of course there's not a lot of food on the road to find. So she ends up carrying him on her back the rest of the way until they can get on a train. After two months, two very hard months, they reach Busan where her uncle and his family live and, and um, surprise her parents and her her toddler brother have made it there before them. But Sora is very happy to be in a free country with lots of food and, but her mother still thinks of her as not worthy of getting an education because she's a girl. Daughters are not very well thought of. And she wonders if her life will ever really, really change even though she's in South Korea now. And she wants more out of life than be, to be trained to be a good wife. She wants an education. And this story is based on uh, the author's mother's life. And um, it's a very hard book to read at times, but I thought Sora is just portrayed as such a courageous girl. She just never gives up. And she's very deserving of a happy ending for herself and having her dream of education, getting the education fulfilled. And this is the author, excuse me, Julie Lee. <coughs> Sorry. Her mother was 15 when she fled North Korea for South Korea. And a lot of the experiences that are in the book, including the bombing attack, actually happened to her when they were fleeing the country. And she did have a mother who didn't really care that she got an education, but, um, but she made it. And, and this is a really, um, it's just a more impacting story because it's basically true. And um, this is actually Julie's first book. 
I don't know what her second one, how she can follow that, but um, hopefully she'll be writing some more. So that is Brother's Keeper. Wow. Was it recently published? It is a new book, so. Oh, okay. Um, let's see. Cool. So um, about summer of last year. Oh, okay. Cool. So pretty current. Yeah, it's it looks familiar. That's that's <laughs> what I think. Maybe I was like, is it probably new? But wow. yeah, it's going to be in the middle school because mm. of the subject. Yeah. And yeah, it's pretty pretty intense and sensitive subject too. Yes. So, wow, that's pretty. I think it's even more powerful. Yeah, like you said, like knowing that it was based off of her mother's experiences. Mm -hmm. so. And there's there's photos in the back of her mother. Mm. And and a timeline which makes it very useful for yeah. following the korean war right. and up to today because i guess since they they never signed a peace treaty north and south korea are still technically at war with each other right right mm. tough very tough mm -hmm. Mm. okay so i thought i would go ahead i went a little bit younger it's funny you started with oh. an older book <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and i went a little bit younger I usually do middle school, but I I think uh, I really wanted to do this one because it it's a cute color. Like, yeah, I feel like I can relate. Not the way I was, she's dressed, of course, but <laughs> <laughs> um, it really highlights Japanese culture and traditions. So, and I sometimes I kind of follow the, along those lines too with my family. Um, so <clears throat> this is Jasmine Toguchi uh, Mochi Queen by Debbie Michiko Florence. Um, it's funny because my grandmother's name is also Michiko. So <laughs> it's like, oh, okay. Um, so this is in our beginning chapter book section and it was published in 2017. And this is actually the first book. All the books that um, I highlight, at least three out of four of them are going to be the first book um, because I think it's better to do, to introduce the series instead of just going straight to the newest one. Um, so you can get a little bit of background, at least with the first one. So this book is about uh, the Taguchi family is getting ready for the new year, which means good food, uh, homemade mochi, which is a traditional Japanese uh, rice cake treat, mm -hmm. and time well spent with close relatives, including their obachan, our grandmother, and she's visiting from Japan. And eight-year-old Jasmine Taguchi has an older sister, two-year-old. Two she's two years older, Sophie, who has always been the first to do so many things. Uh, she got to, she got to go to school first, of course, since she's older. She got to learn how to play the piano first, and she learned how to read first. Now she is two years older, just keep that in mind. And now Sophie is 10. Her older sister is 10. That means she's old enough to help with the Japanese tradition, mochitsuki, mochitsuki. And we be allowed to help roll the delicious mochi dough with all the other female relatives. And this has always been a favorite family tradition in their family. What, um, what, what does Jasmine get to do on New Year's though? She gets to babysit her little cousins. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, Jasmine thinks that this year is going to be different. Even though Jasmine knows that Sophie will be allow allowed to help with prepare for, to prepare with, for the holiday, Jasmine will strive higher and be one of those that pounds the, mo the mochi dough. But everyone knows that this responsibility is only meant for boys. Yeah, so keep in mind, you know, it's a heavy, heavy hammer. That when you go ahead and pound the dough, um, and it's, you have to be quick at the same time. So not only do you need strength, but you need to be fast on um, actually hammering the dough. So everyone knows that it's meant for boys and even Obachan has to remind Jasmine that this tradition calls for someone who is older and stronger. This part of the mochi process means that one person uses a giant mallet to pound the mochi and in between each swing, another person must turn the dough. But what most people don't know is that this process is done super, super fast. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've seen any videos of them. Mm -mm. Oh my goodness, it's kind of scary when the person has to turn the dough because in between each swing, the, like literally it's this fast 
So that means wow. the person has to go in between each pound to flip like a big oh my gosh. brown piece of dough. I know, like, oh my goodness. Oh my gosh. So it's literally each swing is basically done in a second and then same with the turning. So will Jasmine be able to convince her family to let her be the one to carry and swing the mallet? Oh man, this is, it's gonna be pretty scary if she does because she has to somehow lift the mallet and then drop it. So it's kind of funny. <laughs> so I connected most with this one, especially since they're, um, we always had the family tradition of like, you know, everybody coming together on New Year's Day and we all have like our own cultural feast, like um, special foods and things that you have to have for breakfast. And each thing is supposed to represent something um, like good luck or um, in with money, wealth, or uh, good luck with like finding a loved one, good luck with marriage, good luck with having a, um, a baby if you want, if you're expecting or want to actually have a baby. Um, but yeah, and but the mochi is also very important too. You're supposed to have mochi every year um, at the beginning of the year on New Year's Day to give all around good luck for the whole next year. And then, yeah, and so we always, during um, our Japanese breakfast for New Year's, they always, uh, we always have uh, mochi in a soup. So it's pretty cool. Now, I actually highlighted Debbie Michiko Florence before um, with uh, the, her previous novel, Keep It Together, Keiko Kaza, mm -hmm. Ke Keiko, uh, Keep It Together, Keiko Carter. And um, there isn't a picture of her in the back, but there's a little blurb. And she's actually third generation uh, Japanese American. And she actually lives in Southern California. It would be really cool to highlight her, um, this book too, and obviously this type of Japanese tradition, especially since I, I do that too. And yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the first of, I believe, four other books. I do not have them currently with me, unfortunately. Someone checked them out. <laughs> so. <No. laughs> yeah. so it's a good book, I swear. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. I've seen the cover. I haven't, I haven't read that series yet. Yeah, it's cute. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is Dragon Mountain by Katie and Kevin Sang. And this is the story of surfer Billy Chan. He's sent by his family to middle China to practice his Mandarin and get better at it. So he's sent to a summer camp. And he has no idea that when he arrives there, he's going to be part of an attempt to save the world. He meets the other campers who include Charlotte, who's another American. There's Dylan, he's from Ireland, and Ling Fei, she's the granddaughter of Old Gold, who's the camp director. <coughs> Excuse me. The four of them quickly bond together as friends and they form a team to meet the camp challenges. And the first one that they, they need to go find dragon fruit. They figure that out from the clue. That's what they need to find. So Ling Fei says, oh, she knows where it is. So they head off and they get to where, where it's supposed to be. And all of a sudden there's a terrible earthquake. And they even think that they see a tiger, which is really odd. And so they race back to camp and no one else felt the earthquake. Everyone else is just carrying on like nothing happened. So they think, did it really happen? Were we all four dreaming? What, you know, what's going on? So the next day they go back to where the earthquake happened and it was by a mountain and they see a river coming out of the mountain. And, but this river is gold, has gold in it. So they decided to enter the cave of the mountain. And when they get in there, they find what they could never have imagined. They find four dragons. And the dragons are kind of the last of their kind because there's a really um, bad dragon known as just simply the great one who's going to be taking over the world. And it's up to the kids and those four dragons to stop him. And just as in some of the movies we've seen, they bond with their dragons. They each bond with a dragon. And they also get powers from the dragons. So that's pretty cool. 
So they have to fight against um, a dragon that they thought was a friend, Demetrius. Turns out to be, uh uh, no, he's working with the great one. And bad things have been happening to the dragons. So will they be able to defeat the bad dragons and stop the great one from coming through the portal into the world? Well, surprise, it's the first in a series, so we don't know. But I, I really enjoyed the characters, even though I thought Dylan was a little whiny, but I liked the characters of the dragons, the interaction of, of friendship between the dragons and the kids. And um, there's some surprises, some people that you think you trusted, some dragons you think you trusted, turn out not to be so trustworthy. So I'm looking forward to the second book in this series. I don't know how many there will be, but uh, this is Dragon Mountain. And as I said, this is by Katie and Kevin Sang. And they met in Hong Kong when they were both studying the broad bear. Mm. Um, Kevin was born actually in Denmark in Copenhagen, but he grew up in Atlanta. Mm. And Katie's from California. And uh, since they met, they've married, they now have a little girl and they live in London and they spend their time making up stories and thinking about what they want for dinner. <laughs> that's, that's pretty much all the information I found yeah. out about them. But um, they have another series called Sam Wu. Sam Wu is not afraid of, mm. and it's more kind of, um, I think it's more kind of a chapter book series. So, mm. But Dragon Mountain, definitely a great adventure. Mm. Very cool, very cool. I like how they're like trying to figure out what to eat for dinner. I'm like, wow, that sounds like everybody. <laughs> I, know. I, know. I can relate. Yeah. <laughs> Decisions, you know? Mm. Yeah. Okay. So let me see this one. Their next one is uh, mm. Arusha and the End of Time by Roshani Chakshi. Ch Ch Chakshi. I think that's how you pronounce. I apologize if I did not pronounce it correctly. But <laughs> so um, this is a children's fiction book. It'll be in our children's fiction section. And it was published uh, three years ago in 2018. So 12 year old Arusha has always told her seventh grade classmates lie after lie about her amazing life and all the extravagant things she's seen outside of Atlanta, Georgia. Of course, they were all lies. She didn't really. Um, she did all this in order to look cool and fit in with the other students. But her classmates finally catch her in on her lie when they confront her at her door and they see that she's really not in Paris, France with her mother, but mm -hmm. actually living at the Museum of Ancient Indian Art and Culture with mm -hmm. her sister. Uh, trying to impress them with her knowledge of ancient Indian artifacts and mythology. He basically acts as a tour guide on a daily basis. It's pretty funny. But so she's trying to prove that, you know, she does know something about ancient uh, Indian mythology and artifacts. So she tries to explain to her about all, explain to her friends about all the different artifacts that they walk through in the museum. And of course, like her friends were not were not impressed. And when she finally actually tells them of the uh, dia, I think is what you call it, like a cursed lamp. And maybe that's, no, I don't think that's it. But anyways, well, um, <laughs> when she finally explains to them about the dia, the cursed lamp, her friends actually dared her to light the cursed lamp. Mm -mm. The thing is when you light it, something bad's gonna happen, right? Well, legend says that only one of the five Pandava brothers, those who are a child of a god, um, could actually successfully light the lamp. The, but uh, so, you know, do you think like she could actually do, <laughs> do you think she could actually light it? I mean, she's not really one of the Pandava brothers, right? Well, unfortunately, <laughs> she successfully lit it. <laughs> Uh-oh. Yeah, this comes to a surprise as a surprise, of course, especially um, not only was she successful in lighting the lamp, 
the sleeper demon was released and will stop at nothing from reaching the god Shiva, Sh uh, Sh Shiva, lord of destruction. Everyone around her, including her mother who was away from the chaos, were physically frozen in time. But everything mm. on the outside of that, you know, the yeah, museum uh, is totally fine. Everything moves on. Um, and it turns out that Aru is actually a reincarnated, she finds out now, <laughs> reincarnated spirit of one of the Pandava brothers. And she oh. must find out, she must find her other soul related brothers to stop the sleeper demon from reaching Shiva with the help of Subala or who she calls Boo. Her guardian is a, her guardian helper in the form of a pigeon. <laughs> Wow, <laughs> he's kind of rude too because he 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 finds that he needs to be respected, or you know, younger children should at least be more respectful to you know ancient ones or spiritual you know <laughs> spirits. Um, so he's kind of he's kind of funny, <laughs> very snarky. Um, well, hopefully they'll be okay, right? They should be able to find the other four brothers and then stop Shiva from reaching the Lord of Destruction. But we don't know, and you won't know until you pick up this book and find out. Now, if you like Rick Reardon, for those who like Rick Reardon books, if you like the Rick Reardon imprint, obviously this is the one of them, the Rick Reardon Presents imprint. Um, and any mythology books, you'll definitely like this one. Mm. And then, so since this is the first one, I guess maybe it kind of it kind of maybe spoils it if you know that there are two other books. Wow. <laughs> yeah, but you don't know what's going to happen. And so this one I believe is the second one. This one, uh, Arusha and the Song of Death. And this one is the latest one, Arusha and the Tree of Wishes. Wow. Yeah, I think. The last one was published last year, so. But yeah, oh, and then, um, and so, as you can see, this is the author right here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then Rick Gruden right there. And uh, so she is, she's uh, Indian, I believe Indian American. Yeah. And she lives in Georgia and says y'all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but she doesn't really have a Southern accent. And yeah, so if you want to read more of her books, definitely look up her name. Yeah. She has other books uh, in other sections as well. So yeah, I think she, I think she, there was a little bio about her saying that she actually did a lot of extensive research about mm. Indian mythology. So yeah. especially since they have so many gods. So. Yes. A lot of tales. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, this is a little lighter story. This is Mindy Kim, class president by Lila Lee, illustrated by Dung Ho. And uh, Mindy is, con is, she is asked by her friends to run for class president. And her platform is friends, kindness, and snacks for everyone. Sounds like a winning platform to me. But she has to make a speech and she's scared about that. Um, so she practices making the speech with uh, her babysitter, her dad, and her stuffed animals as a very supportive audience. And she thinks she's, she's feeling a little more confident. But the week, weekend before the um, campaign speeches is Halloween. And she goes to the carnival with her dad, and they go into the haunted house. And she finds out she's a little more courageous than she thought. So Monday comes, she gives her speech and she's very happy about it, very satisfied. And she just, she wants to win and she would not mind if she lost as long as it's not mean Brandon. And so, but you have to read to find out if she wins and becomes the class president. Um, there's very expressive black and white illustrations all through the book. Let me see if I can find some here. 
right there. She's having lunch with her friends. And this is part of a series, Mindy Kim. She lives alone with her dad because her mother um, passed, has passed away. So it's just the two of them. But this is Mindy Kim, class president. This is Lila Lee, the author. I think she kind of looks like a grown up Mindy Kim. Yeah. And she was um, actually born in South Korea, but she has lived in the United States for a long, long time. And she started writing her own stories in fourth grade when a teacher encouraged her to do so. And she's written ever since. She's worked at a lot of different jobs. Um, but when she's not writing, she says she's teaching kids, she's petting cute dogs, mm -hmm. and she's searching for the perfect bowl of shaved ice. Oh, and she lives in uh, she lives in Dallas now, so I don't know if shaved ice is a thing in Dallas or not. Mm. Yeah. So she may have to be searching a long time. <clears throat> yeah, but that was Mindy Kim, class president. Yeah. She might have to travel to like Hawaii or mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe come more towards the, I don't know, <laughs> towards the ocean. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why shaved ice is a big thing. <clears throat> yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's a Hawaiian thing. Pretty funny. Also Pacific Islands, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Okay, so this next one is also part of a series. And it's called mm. Dragon Warrior by Katie Zhao it's from you guys. Dragon Stories. I know, yeah. And so you get, I think that's kind of like when you get into the Chinese mythology fantasy type thing, like, you know, the dragon is a big representation. Mm -hmm. So, yep, it's inevitable. <laughs> so this one's called Dragon Warrior by Katie Zhao. And this is in the children's fiction section. And so like fourth, fourth, fifth, uh, grade and this was published in 2019 and then the second one was published in uh, last year actually this one's a, a new one but I'll, I'll show you later so um, 12 year old Farin Lu and her younger brother Alex live in the Jade Society community this is a community an elite community of warriors and demon slayers centered in San Francisco's Chinatown and they lived here all their lives. For all, for all of Farin's and, Alex's, Farin's and Alex's lives, their father has been training her, on, uh, training them until the day he felt obligated to fulfill a quest to uphold his warrior duties and, nev and he never came back, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. This was about, I think, a couple years ago. Unfortunately, the Jade Society leaders did not like this and labeled their father as a traitor. It makes it to make matters worse. Most of the community have been prejudiced against the two siblings because of their mixed heritage, especially um, her because of their mixed heritage. They're half Chinese and part Greek, Egyptian and Turkish. Wow. Far, yeah, you know. Farin inherited more of her mother's features with a darker skin tone. She's on the cover and brown hair and like lighter brown hair and Alex inherited more of their father's features, black hair and pale skin. Unfortunately, their mother passed away while giving uh, birth to Alex. And so they were left under the care of their grandfather, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the lunar, but of course the Lunar New Year is upon them and the Jade Society uh, celebrate, but also they need to be armed and ready for any potential demonic threats, any demons to come since the Lunar New Year is when demons are the strongest. But everything should be fine as long as they have the strongest, fiercest warrior within their community called the Heaven Breaker. It's like usually the, the God's champion, I guess mm -hmm. you could say. So, um, of course the Jade Society have become a little too relaxed and ignore their defenses. Um, because there hasn't been a demon sighting in decades. I believe they said since 1983. It's older than I am. And so what do you think decides to show up this year? Yep, demons decide to show up. And guess who defeats the first two? And it's Farin, Farin. 
I hope I'm pronouncing her name right. Mm -hmm. Well, turns out the gods have chosen her to wield Feng, Feng, Feng Huang, <laughs> Feng Huang, <laughs> which is this double edged golden sword or spear. Mm. And then I bet you can imagine what the Jade Society thinks of this. So because she wields this spear, that means that the gods have chosen her or nominated her to be the heaven breaker. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So she, they, but of course they nominate her. Does she actually like feel worthy of the, is she really worthy of the title? She, she actually has to go on a, basically embark on a journey and overcome all the challenges that she must face. And so her and her brother need to go on a quest and get to that, get to those challenges and hopefully win. And then she can have that title. Um, but alongside that, you, she also has to deal with, you know, demons being released into the world and possibly stopping them at any cost. So if you like Rick Reardon, obviously Rick Reardon is the, <laughs> he's really yes. the highlight of, the <laughs> of this, but He's not a part of this. This isn't part of his imprint. I don't think, no, it's, um, but very similar because obviously it deals with mythology um, and uh, Chinese mythology specifically. And so uh, I definitely suggest you pick this up. It's pretty, it's a very adventurous book. So, mm -hmm. man, so this is the first book. So this one is the second. Oh. Girl. Yeah, this one came out in December. A Dragon Warrior novel. So, yeah. Ooh, fallen hero. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know. What could that mean? But, and then, so Katie Zhao, she is actually in the back of this book right here. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, sorry, glossy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so she grew up in Michigan and she likes to bury her nose in a good book, like everyone does. Uh, writing in her journal, she actually went to University of Michigan. And she, so she wrote this, I believe this is her debut novel. This is like her first. But yeah, she likes reading, singing, dancing. She says badly. <laughs> <laughs> and checking out new restaurants and now lives in Brooklyn, New York. Oh yeah, this is her debut novel. She's wow. Uh, yeah, Chinese Pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. Pretty cool. Yeah. Hey. All right. My last book is Any Day With You by May Respicio. And this is the story of Kaya. Kaya always makes a list each summer of the things that she's going to do with her tatang, her great grandfather. They're going to take walks on the beach. They're going to watch the sunset. They're just going to have adventures every day. But then he announces that he is moving back to the Philippines at the end of the summer and he will stay there for the rest of his life. He just feels a need to, to go back home. And so she's just devastated. And she, she said, I'm just going to dedicate my summer to making him change his mind. And she, she tries to think of how she can do this. And one way is to enter a filmmaking contest with two of her best friends and um, and if they win and if they make a great film then he'll see what he's missing out on if he leaves so they start making this film and they talk about what you know what will the subject be they decide that it's going to be a modernized version of the story of a bakunawa and that's a character from one of the filipino t folk tales that tatang has told them over and over and over again and the bakunawa is um, a sea creature who was so overwhelmed by the beauty of all the moons that he gobbled them up and caused an eclipse. So they think that's going to be really cool. And Kaya also thinks that this will be a, a time for her to um, be seen as special in her family because they're, they're all very talented. Her mom is a professor of Filipino culture. Her dad works in film as a special effects creator. Her sister's going to be a doctor and her, her uncle is just this fantastic baker. So she's got a lot to live up to. And uh, 
Each day brings new adventures as they work on the film, new experiences, new challenges. But uh, the mainstay a lot of time is the food. There's lots, there's always food. There's sweet rice, there's bananas, fried bananas and ube, which is um, a Filipino purple yam. They have these cupcakes that they just can't resist, especially when her uncle bakes them. And what's really cool is they live in Santa Monica and they live pretty close to the beach. So they can spend every day at the beach. But time passes, the film is made. You have to read to find out if they win the contest or not. But to Tong, he's just, he's 90 years old and he's just the most energetic senior citizen ever. He's always up for a new adventure with Kaya they even crash a wedding together. <laughs> and he's just hes just ready for anything. He just has boundless energy and he makes friends wherever he goes. So he is a really cool guy and thats he's always been part of her life. So that's all she miss him. But they do have a farewell party. The day comes and they bring together all their family, Kaya's friends and their families, Jitong's um, longtime friends from the local retirement home and Kaya's uh, mother's students. And they met him when she had him come in as a guest lecturer because he was a survivor of the Batang um, death march. Mm. And so that's a very sobering, you think this is a pretty lighthearted book, but then they start talking about some of his experiences and it gets serious quickly. But overall, this is a story filled with gentle humor, good humor, um, some serious moments, and lots and lots of family love and support um, during Kaya's struggle to accept the change that's going to come, and also to find her own place in, in the family. She's a makeup artist, but she doesn't realize how good she really is until, um, until they make this film. Mm. But uh, this is Any Day With You. And so this is the author, May Respicio, oh. and she is very involved in the Filipino American community in LA. And she's overseeing a lot of literary events and screenwriting courses. And um, she's, she lists some of the fun jobs she's had in her life. She was the worst waitress ever. <laughs> I think if I was ever a waitress, I would win that. But um, she Same also here. sold Ginsu knives, which is those very sharp Whoa. knives that you see on TV. And she was a fancy Hollywood screenwriter's assistant. Oh. But her favorite job now is being mom to two awesome boys. And they, she lives with her family up in Northern California in what she calls the suburban wild. Mm. And she has a couple of other books out too, but this, that was, um, and she's even holding it, Ending Day With yeah. You by May Respicio. That's so cool. Damn. Yeah. <laughs> you just reminded me when you said that as a Filipino, um, I think the Aru Shaw, I picked that one for sure, I think. And I, I think, so I'll pull it up again. But the author, that was her. Mm -hmm. um, she's actually half Indian, half Filipino, I believe, mm -hmm. or half, um, or part Polynesian. So yeah, it's interesting. I just wanted to make sure I added that in. I was like, wait, <laughs> <laughs> I need to make sure. Oops. Anyways, very cool. Very cool. Um, so to get a little bit more uh, down <laughs> deeper. Oh. So this is my last book and it's called Under the Painted Sky by Stacy Lee. This was published in 2015. It's in the middle school section and or the seventh grade home reading list section. So these lists, uh, these are the lists uh, that we actually chose titles for to put on these lists. And they're for each grade level. We have a list for, for kinder all the way to eighth grade. And this one landed in our seventh grade list. So <clears throat> it's gonna get deep and dark. This, <laughs> this book takes place in 1849 in Missouri and a 15 year old Chinese American Samantha is in really big trouble after coming home to her house on fire and discovering that her father never made it out of the house in time mm. incredible dread rushed through her 
On top of that, she's even more sad knowing that the last conversation she had with her father, with her loving father, was her complaining and arguing about how they planned to move west because it's the gold rush era instead of back to New York. She did have some sense of relief when her landlord offers her room and board um, in exchange for, so, for at, his local, at his local hotel that he owns in exchange for her services. And these are not light services. <laughs> these are pretty bad services mm. that she would actually be um, doing. Um, so, but then, so she discovers that he wants to make her one of the female workers and then tries to take advantage of her. Mm. <clears throat> Basically almost attempted rape. Yeah terrified at what's about to happen she accidentally kills him mm. luckily though i guess luckily i, <laughs> I don't know after ha doing that so that it's so it's very traumatizing for her luckily a young slave girl named anime she's one of the workers there too helps her quickly escape and they both decide to travel west on the old oregon trail mm. During this time, their chances of survival are slim, of course. You can imagine during that time. Uh, so it's very slim because them being two young girls and also one of them is African-American and the other is Chinese-American. During this time, Chinese-Americans were not really liked. Um, even in the book, I believe, an anime, the uh, the the slave girl, the African-American girl, she actually mentions that, you know, she actually has probably almost higher privileges than her, than Samantha, the Chinese American, during that time and basically where they're going. So they're starting in Missouri and going all the way to California. And that's a long ways away. Yeah. And there's a lot of states in between that, you know, they, they might run into a lot of danger and prejudice. So, so in order to try and safely get through, they make the decision to disguise themselves as boys and change their names to Andy, that's Anime's name, and Sam, which is Samantha's name. They thought they were definitely in trouble during their journey, but got lucky when a trio of young cowboys take the girls under their wings and offer, offer protection and friendship. They get really lucky. As the group of five head west, the dangers mount but so do the laughs and bonds that they make. Will they be able to make it safely to the, to the West without, without the boys finding out their true identity? And if they do, what would they think or do? You gotta pick up the book to find out. So <laughs> <laughs> since it is in our seventh grade um, reading list, it, it's usually, all the books that we chose are really, really good. And I, I highly recommend this one, so. Yeah. Um, so. Stacy Lee is right there. Yeah. Oh, pretty. Yeah. And she's fourth generation Chinese American. And she actually is a Southern, she was born in Southern California. And she went to UCLA and she got a law degree. She's technically a lawyer. <laughs> now she plays piano, wrangles children, <laughs> and <laughs> writes young adult fiction. She still, and now she lives in San Francisco, so she's still a Californian. And um, so, yeah, and I guess since she's fourth generation Chinese American, most likely, you know, her family was probably around during this time period. So, probably hits, probably hits home pretty well. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow, a lot going on. I know. Oh my goodness. Oh, and then, um, so that was my last book, but I also wanted to highlight that we do have uh, another one that I think is pretty cool. It's called Asian, um, Awesome Asian Americans, 20 Stars Who Made America Amazing. And this is by mm -hmm. Phil Amara and Oliver Chin and illustrated by Juan Calle, I think. No um, photos of the authors, unfortunately, in the back, but yeah, pretty cool. And it's pretty cool because there's a lot of pretty cool illustrations, you know, uh, showing them. And they even highlight the famous Bruce Lee, mm -hmm. who I thought was born in Hong Kong or China. 
but really he was born in San Francisco. Okay. But he died in Hong Kong. So yeah, I think that's where he trained and everything like that. So okay. So that's it for us. <laughs> All right. Well, that was that was some more great books to add to my list. Yeah. And so we want to remind you that you can find these books on our website. If you look under chapter chat 0521. And we really enjoy talking about our books, as you can tell. And we hope that you'll join us next month. But this month being um, a very special month of May and celebrating Asian American Pacific Islander Month. <laughs> I know there's a longer title, but that's all I could remember. <laughs> um, there's going to be a lot of special programs going on. So you want to check our website today at one o'clock. You can watch Janine do an origami demonstration of making a crane for the um, flying cranes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Sadako and the Thousand Cranes would mm -hmm. be a good book to read with that. Yeah, I think. And there's going to be um, the Take and Make Crafts. Um, so, yeah. But I'm not too sure if they're all gone, but. See, yeah. call your local to-go location or the closest to-go location and see if they have any origami um, take and makes for you to pick up. You can schedule yeah. and pick up through them. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And there'll be some more uh, book talks going on. There's mm -hmm. um, a, and, um, make and take um, for making your own Zen garden. Mm -hmm. So just keep checking on our website and um, yep. this will be a great month of celebration. And I guess we'll see you. Yeah. next month and hopefully we'll see some of you actually in the library by then yes so Crossing keep checking fingers. for that <laughs> open date yeah. all righty sounds good okay yeah. all, all right. right well see you pam bye janine <laughs> see you next month yep see you then <laughs>